Prophet gave the title of Turjuman al Quran or the interpreter of the Quran. He informed that this chapter, this surah, was revealed in Mecca. And for those of you that have read different references concerning chapters in the Quran, you notice some of them are revealed in Mecca, some of them are revealed in Medina. And you might wonder why is it even mentioned? What is the significance or the importance of knowing that a chapter was revealed in Mecca or it was revealed in Medina? But generally speaking, the chapters of Mecca share certain qualities because the Quran revealed over 23 years of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's prophethood addressed the issues that the Muslims were faced with. The Quran was not revealed addressing abstract issues which were not related to the circumstances in which the Muslims were living. No. The various verses, they touched issues that were directly related to the people, either in areas regarding the basics of the faith, or the laws, or knowledge of the past, those who came before the previous civilizations, the previous prophets, etc., etc. And though there are certain similarities between the chapters revealed in Mecca, which they share among themselves, generally speaking having short verses, and concentrating on Tawheed, whereas the verses of Medina tend to share certain qualities, that of having long verses, and that the verses tended to con concentrate more on the laws, because it was in Medina that the Muslim community was established. The beginnings of the Islamic State were begun. But the most important point with regards to knowing which chapters are from Mecca, which are from Med Medina, are one, to know something of the seerah, or the life of Prophet Muhammad Because by putting the chapters in their chronological order, in terms of when they were revealed, we can extract from the Qur'an something of the life of the Prophet Muhammad himself. And that is a guide for us, as Allah said in the Qur'an, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا there is in the Messenger of Allah the best of examples for you. Right? The second important point that is extracted from knowledge of the Meccan and the Medinan surahs is that certain laws were revealed in a gradual form. For example, the laws concerning intoxicants. In the early verses, we find Allah talking about the, the bees and how they make honey and how people extract from the honeys, etc. Uh, intoxicants. Just a general description. If this was all that we read in the Qur'an, one might think that the Qur'an is uh, praising intoxicants. However, other statements were revealed as the community progressed concerning intoxicants wherein Allah said that there is good in them and evil but the evil in them is greater than the good this is again sign for us then verses were revealed saying not to come to prayer in a state of intoxication right? and then the final verses came saying in intoxicants, gambling, and divination, and the idols, places where sacrifices are made to the idols, all of this is filth from Satan, 
So avoid it totally. Now if we didn't know the order in which these verses came, then somebody could take the verses out of order and say, well, the final recommendation was not to come to prayer in a state of intoxication. That, you know, at first Allah was very strict to the Muslims in order for them to, to uh, you know, get a hold of themselves and, and be more dedicated in their worship. So He told them to avoid it altogether. Then later on, He told them that there was good in it and there was some evil. Right? But the, the evil was greater than the good. So, you know, you shouldn't get too much involved in it. And then, in the end, He told us that we should just avoid prayer at the time of intoxication. You see? You can turn the order around and bring your own kind of interpretation as to how. Because truly, there were some commands in the early part of Islam which were very strong, which were relaxed later. As we well know, Prophet ﷺ had said that making ghusl on Yom al Jumu'ah was compulsory for every Muslim. In the early days of Islam, it was compulsory. Because this was the time when people were still learning about Tahar and these type of things. They used to wear these, you know, garments that, you know, with the sweat and everything and they get together, sitting all together, there were odors coming from it. Okay? So, he insisted, it was compulsory. But then later on he said that making wudu on Yom al is okay. But the ghusl is better. You see? So, there are cases like that in the Sharia where it was strong in the beginning and relaxed afterwards. Prophet Muhammad said in the beginning that he prohibited people from going to the grave at all. Prohibited going to the graves altogether. Then later on he said, visit them because they are good to help you to remember the next life. Allah gave a relaxation because in the early days people were involved in idolatry, a lot of it was connected with ancestor worship and these type of things. So they were banned from the Graveyards altogether until they could get clear Tawheed, the principles of Tawheed, the unique unity of Allah. And then after that was firm in them, then they were allowed to go back to the grave. So similarly, you see, certain people could take this uh, and argue. Well, this is what it is. Same thing, the, the, the alcohol was totally banned in the beginning because the people were drunkards, etc. Then they needed to ban it altogether. Then later on as they became stronger in their faith, etc., then they could take a little bit, you know, and know how to control it. So, really, Islam does permit, in fact, recommend you to take a little. As some doctors will tell you, you know, some alcohol with your meal helps with digestion. <laughs> okay? Huh? So, I'm just saying that if we don't know the correct order, then people can come with all kinds of stories to us. But this is by knowing the Meccan and the Medina, knowing the order in which the chapters, the, the surahs, the verses came, we know that, in fact, the final command was to stay away altogether. And it was the earlier command which said there was good in it and evil, but the evil was greater than the good. Then the next level was to avoid it at the time of prayer. And actually, even though the final command is the total prohibition, the earlier two commands are not totally abrogated. Not totally. Because there are circumstances which can come up in your life where they are still applicable. Right? In alcohol, we use alcohol to clean wounds. Isn't it? Rubbing alcohol. There is good in it in certain places, but not down your throat. That's the point. There's no good in it there. So the evil in it, which is what most people use it for, for drinking, not cleaning their wounds, this is much greater than the good. That remains till today. And also, if you go to the hospital, for example, and you have received anesthesia, right? Now, when you come out for your operation, you're still groggy and you know. Are you going to go and pray in that state? No. You don't go and pray until you have come down altogether. So it still has points of application even till today. Right? Anyway, the point is that this chapter is from the Meccan period, as attested by Ibn Abbas, the interpreter of the Quran. This chapter, generally speaking, calls mankind, Allah calls mankind in it, to reflect on the most important things in our lives, to 
divert our attention from the common goal of life which is wealth, the accumulation of wealth, to the more appropriate goal for the believers, those who understand why they are here, the purpose of their creation. The, the goal which is appropriate to understanding the purpose of creation is not the accumulation of wealth, but worship, reflection of Allah, remembrance of Allah, and establishing the worship of God. Now, there are a few hadith, authentic hadith concerning the surah. Before we actually look at what Allah is saying, we can see some of the circumstances. There's one hadith which is found in Sahih al-Bukhari in which Prophet ﷺ on the arrival of Abu Ubaidah informed the companions about something of the future with regards to the accumulation of wealth. And he said, By Allah, I am not afraid that you will become pure, poor, that you will become poor in the future. Because the companions, generally speaking, in that time were poor. Most of the companions were poor. There were some who had wealth, but most of them were poor. So he informed that he was not afraid that in the future for them, that they would become even poorer, more destitute. But he said, I'm afraid that the worldly wealth will be given to you in abundance. This is what he was afraid of as it was given to those nations before you. And you will start competing with each other for it as they did. And then it will divert you as it did them. This was the Prophet's fear for his followers. That wealth would become abundant amongst them and they would deviate from the path as the nations before that of the Muslim nation. On another instant, Ibn Omar radiallahu anhu reported that the Prophet was asked his companions, Aren't any of you able to recite a thousand verses of the Quran daily? And one of the companions replied, Who amongst us could recite a thousand verses of the Quran daily? He replied, Aren't any of you able to, re- to recite Al Hakum al Takafur? In this uh, narration, he is telling us that the reward for reciting Surah at takafur with reflection on its meanings, not just parroting the Arabic words, is similar to the reward of reciting a thousand verses of the Quran. In that, if the Quran were divided up into thousands of verses, likely you will find that a thousand or more verses address the issues found in al hakum al takafur over and over again. Allah will address them in different ways, using different terminologies, with different examples, etc. But the same issues are there in al hakum al takafur We find them also in thousands of verses in the Quran. On another occasion, a companion, Abdullah ibn al-Shakir, related that he came to the Messenger of Allah while he was reciting Al-Hakum al-Takathur. And he said, Man says, My wealth, my wealth. But, O son of Adam, do you have any of your wealth except what you have eaten and used, worn and worn out, and what you have given in charity and thereby caused it to remain? Prophet ﷺ said this to the companions, to the others, that this is all that comes from wealth. Either you utilize it, use it up, and it is of no benefit to you further, or you give it in charity and it remains with you even after you die.
The first verse begins al hakum takafur Accumulation diverts you. Accumulation of what? Accumulation of wealth. The human being spends most of his waking hours accumulating wealth. This is the reality that we live. As much as we like to be spiritual and you know all the other things, the vast majority of our time is spent accumulating wealth. So Allah warns us. This accumulation of wealth, and wealth is not only measured in terms of money, it's also measured in terms of children. You know, having a lot of children. Right? You know, people who have more children, you know, are looked at as being stronger families. This is something that some people are proud of, having many children. Although, of course, this issues may be reversed to some degree today in these times you know where the West seeks through birth control to control the numbers of people you know and created scare in the mind of the human being that you know you you have children you won't be able to feed them you know so better you only have one you know or two you know this kind of psychological uh, tricks that the West plays on the Muslim world and Prophet Sallallahu said Tazawwaju you know Takatharu you know you should get married and have many children. This is the recommendation of the Prophet ﷺ. At any rate, wealth, children, etc. gives the human being a certain status in this life where he feels he is better than others, etc. And he strives or she strives to gather as much of this wealth around them in order that they would make their lives more pleasurable. The man will be outside in the norm, normal situation, gathering the wealth from the job situations, etc. Whereas the woman will be home spending the wealth and accumulating it in the form of you know, trappings within the home. You know, new this, new that, change the curtains, change the you know the the sofas, you know, every year or every season or whatever, you know, never satisfied with what you have, want to have more to change, always, you know, accumulating more and more. Right? So the accumulation is on both sides. The man outside the home is accumulating, the money that he gets, the wife uses it to accumulate things inside the home. There's a dual process going on. Okay? Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in chapter 8, verse 28. That is Al Anfal. Wa'alamu Annama Amwalukum wa Auladukum Fitna Wa Annallah Indahu Ajrun Avim. Know that you, verily your wealth and children are only a trial, a test, and with Allah is a great reward for those who pass the test. Because this is what we're focusing on, to accumulate. Allah warns us. Warns us that Children and wealth are a test in this life. A test. Because we come into this life without wealth and children, and we leave the life without the wealth and children. We don't take them with us. I mean, of course, people of the past tried to do this. The ancient pharaohs and the others, you know, when they died, they had their slaves, and everybody killed along and buried along with them, believing that in the next life they will still need these slaves, etc., you know, would serve them in the next life. But, you know, we know better, because we see their mummies in the museums and their skeletons and bones, etc., right? So the reality is that we come into this life with nothing and we leave this life with nothing of the material things that people tend to focus on. So, it means then that we should not allow our desire for this wealth, and the children, etc., to divert us from, from what? from knowing what our purpose is in this life. From knowing that we have a duty, a responsibility to worship Allah and that the essence of what comes from the worship of Allah is the remembrance of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, 
again in the 63rd chapter verse 9 Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an zikrillah O believers do not let your wealth or your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah Whoever the verse goes on to say does that are truly the losers Whoever is diverted from the remembrance of Allah by the accumulation of wealth and children has lost what this whole life was about. They've lived and lost. As Allah said, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ By time, all of mankind is in a state of loss. Except those who believe and do righteousness, who have understood what the purpose of this life is about. These are the ones who are not in a state of loss. Otherwise, in this life, once we lose track of Allah and the purpose, we don't remember Allah, then it means that shaitan has us in his grip. We are now become slaves of Satan. Slaves to our own desires, as Allah says in the Quran. Have you not seen the one who takes as his, his God his own desires? Where we have submitted ourselves to our desires. Our desires for wealth becomes our God. Wealth becomes our God. Our desire to get that wealth, this is what we have submitted ourselves to. And the desire for wealth is unending. As Prophet said, if the son of Adam was given a valley of gold, he would want another one. And the only thing that will fill his mouth is the dirt of his grave. That's the only thing that will stop it. Up until that point, the more you have, the more you want. So Prophet ﷺ said, Ta'isa Abdul Dirham or Abdul Dinar. The slave or worshipper of the Dirham and the Dinar will be wretched. Their lives will be wretched. So Allah is telling us, let it not be like that. Don't allow the wealth and the children to divert us from the members of Allah. Though we will see others around us with wealth. So because Allah told us, الرزق, And Allah has favored some of you over others in sustenance. This is Allah's destiny. Why some people will have some more than we will have. And He told us, do not desire what Allah has favored some of you over others. He told us that He favored some and He said don't desire it. Why? Why not? Because it is a test. Allah gave some what He didn't give you. Because if He gave you what He gave them, it would be too much for you. So He only gave you what is good for you. So the trials of this life are tailor-made. Allah tailors them to each and every personality. What you need, what I need, what he needs, what she needs. That's what Allah gives. As he promises. لا يكلف الله نفعا إلا وسعها Allah does not burden any soul greater than it can bear. So each soul gets what is suitable for it. So Allah favors some over others. Is it that? And Prophet ﷺ said, don't look to those above you, but look to those below you. Those who have more than you, don't look to them. Look to those below you, because it is better to help you to remember the blessings of Allah on yourself. If you look to those below you, you can see how Allah has blessed you, favored you, and you will be thankful to God. But if you only focus on those who have more than you, you will always be wondering, why not me? You know? Why did Allah not you know, give me what He gave this person? Never satisfied. Always designed. Always, you know, having a state of no contentment. You know, you're in a state of distress, duress. Always worrying, trying to get. The more you have, as I said, the more you want. When you have it, you're always counting it. Making sure it doesn't decrease in any way. When the people you see around you, you don't trust them. You feel that maybe they, they're smiling at you, they want something from you. You know, instead of saying smile, Prophet said, smile is sadaqah. 
You know, we should smile at each other. And the person who is all caught up in this gathering of wealth, when he sees people smiling, he feels they want something. You know, there's some, some, some hidden agenda here. They're only smiling so they try to get next to me because they want some of my money. You see, so they cannot even take the simplest of pleasures from the simplest of things. Everything has become so complicated for them. Because they have been diverted from the remembrance of Allah. So their hearts cannot find rest as Allah says, Allah bi zikrillahi tatma'inna al-qulub. It is only with the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find rest. So if we are diverted from the remembrance of Allah, we will not find rest. No rest for us. And Allah says in chapter At-Tawbah, verse 55, Do not let the wealth and ch- their wealth and children amaze you. The wealth and children of the disbelievers. The deviants. People of gone astray. Don't let their wealth and children amaze you. For Allah only wants to punish them with it. In this life, that their souls be taken while they are disbelievers. For them, what Allah has given them, they think, you know, wow, everything is fantastic, you know, it's good. You know, the more bad they do, the more they get. But Allah says, He is punishing them with it. So that they will never give it up. Because when your wealth is taken away, this is when you'll stop and think, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't be so much, you know, keyed in on this wealth if it can go so easily so quickly but when you get more and you get more and the more you want it just keeps coming and coming then you will never give it up you just keep on after it so you will die in that state so it is a punishment so that's why Allah says do not let it amaze you don't desire it and seek it and furthermore he says in the 64th chapter verse 14 inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adu lakum fahdaruhum Surely there is in your wives and children an enemy unto you. So beware them. Beware of them. This is very serious. I'm not telling you that your wealth, your, your wives and your children, they're your enemies. Not enemies in the general sense. But in them, if we do not deal with them according to how Allah has prescribed for us, then they become our enemies. Meaning, that when your wife wants to go outside, all painted up, eyebrow pencil, lipstick, you know, all these things, wearing perfume. And you know, Prophet Muhammad has told you, that the woman who goes outside wearing perfume is an adulteress, a fornicatress, until she returns back to her home. You know that. But your wife is feeling good and you know, you're trying to tell her, but she's saying, oh no, 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 you know, don't you love me? And, and, you know, I want to be beautiful. You know, she gives you all kinds of stories. You know, and, and it touches your heart. You know, you don't want to resist her. So you allow her to go outside. She has become your enemy because she has now caused you to commit sin. Sin which Allah will hold you to account for. Because Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Kullukum ra'in, wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati." Each and every one of you is is a, like a shepherd, responsible for his flock. You will be asked about your flock. What did you do with them? You will be asked. Allah will, sure, she going out like that will be punished for what she did. She will be asked and punished. But you will be asked and punished for allowing her to go out. So she became your enemy, or your children. The children can ask you to do certain things. They want to have a birthday celebration. Birthday. And you know, you heard the lecture. The lectures. That celebration of birthdays is pagan. Not allowed in Islam. But your child is making a big story to you, you know. Our friends, our cousins, everybody's having birthdays. Why not me, you know. Dad, you're being unfair, you know. It's not really, you know, crying and all this so you give in you have a birthday party there it is your child has now become your enemy your child has caused you to sin what is it talking about? what is it talking about really? it's talking about your love your love for your wife and your child is now greater than your love for Allah 
So it's like a form of shirk. The love that you should be giving to Allah, you're giving to your wife and your child. Because when Tawheed is established, when the faith is firm, then we don't do anything which displeases Allah in order to please human beings. So Allah goes on to say, Hatta zurtumul maqabir. The accumulation of wealth, the running after the wealth in all of its forms continues throughout life until we reach the grave, until you visit the graveyard. Hatta zurtumul maqabir. In chapter Al-Am, Al-Am, that's the sixth chapter, verse 44, Allah says, So when they forgot the warning with which they were reminded, we opened to them the gates of every pleasant thing, until in the midst of their enjoyment, in that which they were given, all of them, all of a sudden, we snatched them. When they forgot the warning which Allah had given, about not allowing wealth to divert us from the remembrance of Allah. Shaitan has them now. Allah opens the gate of all the abundance of this world. It comes before them. And in the midst of their enjoyment of this abundance, Allah snatches them in that state of disbelief. Death. When death catches us, of course, then we realize that this was all a test. People, this life, are easily distracted because the consequences of what we're doing are not obvious to us. The consequences we know by way of revelation. Because we see people doing evil and appearing to get good. We see people doing good and appearing to suffer evil. Right? In this life, this is what we see around us. That so many of the evil people seem to get the best out of life. So the consequences of our actions are not obvious to us. It is only through the prophets whom God has sent to us who have informed us of the consequences of our actions that ultimately we are accountable and if it doesn't appear to us in this life we will be held to account in the next so we are invited here when Allah says tells us about this state where people tend to be caught up in this chasing of the material world until they die He's t- Allah is telling us to do what? Don't get caught in that situation. Turn back to Allah before you are caught in that situation. In the fourth chapter, verse 18, Surah An-Nisa, Allah says, There is no repentance for those who continue to do evil until death comes upon one of them. And He says, Indeed, I have now repented. It's too late. If death catches us, it is too late. Repentance then is not acceptable. So, the warning is here. Any of us knows that we're going to live for one more hour, or another day, or a week, or a year. None of us knows what is tomorrow. The reality is that we can die at any time. So if we know that we can die at any time, can we afford to be diverted from the purpose of our creation? No, we can't afford it. The Prophet was quoted by Abdullah ibn Umar as saying, Allah most great and glorious will accept his servant's repentance until the death rattle begins. When the person feels, not when you get sick, you may be sick and die, you can repent before you die. But when you feel the point that death is upon you, the person starts laboring in their breathing. You see the changes going through. 
repentance at that time is not accepted anymore. And none of us knows when we're going to be caught in that situation. Don't think that because you learned La ilaha illallah at some point in your life, you said it on a few occasions, that you will be able to say it on that, that time. Or that you have, or, you know, you've told your family or the family knows that when you're dying they're supposed to say La ilaha illallah and make you say La ilaha illallah, that you'll be able to say it. And die in that state, no. The only way we can guarantee for ourselves the way we are going to end is to choose righteousness now. To commit ourselves to the path of righteousness. Trying to do what is pleasing to Allah and to avoid what is displeasing to Allah. As Allah said, chapter 63, verse 11, Allah will not delay a soul if their appointed time comes. And Allah knows all that you do. Our destiny has been written when we are going to die. We cannot delay our death, nor can we advance it. It's been written. We don't know when it is. So it is for us to work, believing that it can come at any time. Live our lives not fearful of death, in the sense that you are afraid of everything around you, you don't want to leave your home. And as Allah said, you know, that even if you stayed in your beds in the towers of your home and your appointed time has been set, you will die there. You know, if it means lightning will hit that tower and you come crashing down and it kills you. If it is set for you to die at that time, you will die, no matter where you go. So you have a life to live. You have to go out and live it. But you must live it being conscious that you can die at any time. This verse, uh, some of the scholars also interpreted to mean, you know, until you visit the graveyard, that accumulation will divert you until you, up, you know, up to and including the time when you visit the graveyard, meaning that some people will go down to the graveyard. There's so much into the accumulation of wealth and boasting, and, you know, that even in the graveyards, you will see. Some will be building these big domes and houses over their graves, mausoleums, you know, and they will boast about our mausoleum, you know, our family crypt, you know, how lavish and beautiful it is. So they're boasting even in the graveyards itself. Death has no meaning to them. They think their wealth will make them last forever. And I'll talk about another one of this words. And we see, what is one of the, the eighth wonder of the world? Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal is a mausoleum. You know, you read the descriptions of it, how wondrous people, you know, this uh, ruler of India, India was his name, Shah Jahan was his name, you know, built this for his wife back in the 17th century, you know, and this is his expression of his love for his wife. But it is a love which is displeasing to Allah from beginning to end. Because Prophet ﷺ told Ali anhu, to go and any grave he found more than a palm's width above the ground to level it. That structure is haram. Though it is a symbol of Islamic architecture and the greatness of Muslims. No! Actually it is a symbol of Muslims' decline and ignorance. The depths of their ignorance. That they could build such a grandiose you know, monument to the displeasure of Allah. Similarly in Pakistan, you look at the mausoleum over, you know, Ali Jinnah. Huge dome over his grave. People going in there making tawaf around his grave. You know, huge numbers are coming to Ziara, you know. This is... And he is looked at as the founder of, you know, Pakistan. The land of the pure, the pure land. This is something displeasing to Allah, evil. And I'm sure this is something back in our home countries that we are facing today. Because I wouldn't be surprised if each and every one of you back home there in Sri Lanka, right, over the graves of your fathers and your grandfathers and all the others, there are these structures. Whether it be, you know, uh, uh, just a, 
a big white uh, stone which has written on it, you know, born this day, died this day, he was a good man, may God put him in paradise, whatever. You know. Whatever structure, whitewashing it, putting flowers on it, and all, you know, this is imitation of the ways of the pagans. Forbidden in Islam. The grave should look no different from the land around it. Only, as you as a Muslim, this is your relative, you know where it is. There may be a marker on the wall somewhere to identify, row, it's in rows. You're in row A, you know, your grandfather's row A, grave number one. Okay. But beyond that, this is the proper way. Allah goes on, Kalla sawfa ta'alamun. But soon they will know. Hmm? Uh, can we catch the doubts at the end? Let me finish the surah first, okay? Kalla sawfa ta'alamun. But soon you will know. No accumulation will divert you from the remembrance of Allah till you reach the grave. You're so much caught up in it, your death is soon. The reality of this life is, will, be, will soon be clear to you. Prophet ﷺ was quoted by Abdullah as saying, Paradise is nearer to each of you than the strap of his sandal. And so is the hellfire. It is close. Paradise is nearer, is closer to us than the strap of the sandal that we wear. And so is hell. It is around the corner. And we never know when it will come. ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Then, after that, you will soon know. Allah repeats this verse emphasizing the soonness that the point of knowledge of what this life was about is really close you'll find sometimes certain verses in the Quran are, emphas- are repeated for particular emphasis and we do it in English in speaking we will repeat sometimes come here, come here I we mean come here but by saying, come here, come here, it gives more strength, emphasizing the urgency, stressing, come here. We repeat it. Similarly, you'll find certain verses in the Quran where there is a particularly, you know, heavy point to get across, Allah repeats that verse. Sometimes He repeats it in one surah, He repeats it again in another surah. Sometimes He repeats it, you know, in the beginning of this, that same surah and He repeats it later on in the same surah. Sometimes He repeats it in the line and He repeats it in the line after Different ways the verses are repeated for emphasis. Because for us, what a bed from hell or a garden from paradise, you know. But the process of our judgment is beginning from the point of our death. If only you had certain knowledge, if you knew, if we knew what this life was about, we would not be living as we live. Our lives would be totally different if we had certain knowledge. But if we had certain knowledge, then this life would not be a test. So Allah was telling us, if you had certain knowledge, you would be different. But He deliberately didn't give us that knowledge. It was only handed to us through revelation, through what the prophets brought to us in the scriptures. And of course, you have a choice to believe in the prophets or not to believe in the scriptures or not because if Allah had made it such that those people who truly believed in him they would know what this life was about with absolute certainty then no one would go astray who would become like angels but this life is a test from the time we are born till the time we die. No matter whether we believe or we don't believe, the test is an ongoing test in our life. 
And the Prophet ﷺ was reported in Sahih al-Bukhari to have said, If you knew what I know, you would laugh little and cry a lot. If you knew what I know, you would laugh little and cry a lot. Because Allah revealed to him things that he did not reveal to us. He was to carry that message to bear the, the burden of the enmity of the pagans of his time who would try to kill him, try to drive him out of his home, to crush the movement, to kill his family, etc. He had to bear that. So Allah revealed to him certain things which would strengthen him to know the realities of his life. So he told us that if you knew what I know, you would laugh little and cry a lot. It doesn't mean that we should be morose. You know, we just walk around with a frown on our face all the time. We can't laugh. We can't find anything funny or anything. This is life for us. No. Because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he laughed. The circumstances when he laughed. He even made jokes. He did. But that was not the, his character. Meaning, he was just a joker. You know, you have some people who just, every second word comes out of their mouth, you're laughing all the time. Just laugh, laugh, laugh. No. So not his way, because when you always, everything is just a big joke, your whole life becomes a big joke. Then you lose the sensitivity for the test of this life, the trials, etc., etc. You lose it. It's gone. So we're not encouraged Islamically to be laughing all the time. We laugh sometimes. Moderation. Keeping things in moderation. Allah goes on to say, لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ You will surely see the fire. You will surely see the fire. Each and every one of us will see the hellfire. Not in this life, but in the next. In the 19th chapter, verse 71, Allah says, there is none among you who won't be brought near to it, near to the hellfire. Each and every one of us will be brought close to the hellfire. Prophet Muhammad said, this is also found in Sahih al-Bukhari, no one will enter paradise without being shown the place he would have occupied in the fire if he had rejected faith. So that he would be more thankful. And no one will enter the fire without being shown the place he, would, he could have had or occupied in paradise if he had accepted faith so that he would be more sorrowful. So each one will see the place that we would have occupied had we chosen the correct path or the incorrect path. And another occasion Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, Prophet said, a bridge will be brought and placed over hell. The companions asked, O Messenger of Allah, what is this bridge? He said, it is slippery and it has hooks. Some of the believers will cross the bridge in the blinking of an eye. Others as quick as lightning or a strong wind. Fast horses or she camels. Some will cross safely without any harm. Others will receive some scratches and some will fall down into hell. The last person will cross it as if he were dragged over. Sirat, which is placed over him. In the next life, all of us will be shown it. Then you will see it with certainty. In this life, we see it as described by the prophets. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. They describe to us in the scriptures and revelation about the hell. But in that life, we will see it with certainty. Ainul Yaqeen. And that, as the Prophet explained, for the believers, when they see the fire, they will be rejoicing that Allah has saved them from it. So it has two purposes, as the Prophet explained. For the believers, when they see it and see their place in it, that they would have had, and they see they're saved from it, they are rejoicing. Overcome with happiness. But for the disbelievers, it will only increase their state of sorrow and sadness, regret, 
They will be just overwhelmed with it, knowing that they have to be there forever and ever. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ Then verily you will be asked on that day about the pleasures, about what Allah has given us in this life. Each and every one will be asked. Because as we said before, everything that Allah has bestowed on us in this life is a test. Our wealth is a test. We said we came in without it, we leave without it. How we use it is given to us as a trust. If we use it for good, it, it, the blessings of it remain with us. If we use it for evil, the sin of it comes back to haunt us. We will be asked. And the Prophet ﷺ was reported by Anas ibn Malik as saying, A dead person is followed by three. Two of them return and one remains. His relatives, his property, and his deeds follow him to his graveyard. To his grave. The relatives and property return and his deeds remain with him. The Prophet ﷺ was reported by Ibn Abbas and said, There are two blessings of which people are fools, health and free time. These two things which Allah has blessed us with, health and free time, we are fooled about it. Fooled in the thinking that we'll always be healthy, we'll always have free time. But then when we get sick, we get weak, we want to worship and we can't worship, time has run out, this is when we regret. So, as Allah says in the other surah, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ If you become free, if you find free time from your worship, then continue to do other forms of worship. Our life is a continual life of worship. إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ This is the dua Shalala teaches us in the Quran to say Verily, my, my prayers, my sacrifice, my living and dying is for Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Our whole life should be for Allah. There is no vacation that we take from righteousness. No vacation from Islam. Islam is like breathing and eating. It's a part of us. Something you can't take a holiday from eating. Here we fast, but it's not a holiday from eating in the sense that you just quit eating. No, you have to eat something, otherwise you'll die. You can't take any holiday from breathing. You must breathe. Like that, Islam. Like that, submission to Allah. We cannot take a holiday from it. If we take a holiday from it, then it means our Islam is a ritual. Meaning, you have what is known as the Ramadan Muslim. When Ramadan comes along, he is praying day and night. Praying more than anybody else. He is a believer. As soon as Ramadan is over, he takes his holiday. Right. Believing next Ramadan will make up for his holiday time. No, it's not Islam. The Friday Muslim, he only comes for Juma. All week long, he's not making Salah, he makes only Salah and Juma. It's the person in a state of loss, deluded. The religion is only a ritual. That prayer that we make on Juma, which is only once a week, cannot be made in a way acceptable to Allah. It's not possible. If we have not trained ourselves, established proper prayer within ourselves, then we cannot suddenly become sincere in our worship at an instant, once a week, one month a year. No, it doesn't work like that. The reality is that prayer has to be established in our life as a part of our life. That's why Allah doesn't say in the Quran commanding us to pray. He says, Aqim is salah. Establish the prayer. It means five times a day. This is the framework of our life. So, my brothers and sisters, it is for us to reflect on the message of this, the 102nd chapter of the Quran, in which Allah has invited us to reflect on the purpose of our life. As believers, our purpose is to worship Allah. Allah said, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ This is the purpose of our worship. Clearly, 
explained to us in the Quran. So we should have no doubts about it. It is to worship Allah. But we should understand that the worship of Allah is not because Allah needs our worship. We're not worshiping Him because He needs our worship. We're worshiping because we need to worship Him. We are the ones who need, have the need for this worship. Because the worship will make us be what Allah created us to be. Without worship, we cannot attain the stature, the position which Allah has created us for. And it is only that position which is allowed into paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ told his companions, announce to the people that only the true believers will enter paradise. Only the true believers will enter paradise. So let us, dear brothers and sisters, reflect. Reflect on our lives at the lack of contentment in our lives, the dissatisfaction, where it is coming from. It is coming from a lack of focus. We are not focused on the purpose of life. We have been diverted by Satan to the trappings which may help to make our lives more comfortable, but they are not the goal of our lives. And in fact, when we do that, then the very wealth, our wives and our children, become our enemies without us even knowing it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now we may take some questions if you'd like to raise any questions. Uh, maybe from the sisters if they would like to write the questions down and send them forward. Do others have any questions you'd like to raise your hand and ask regarding this uh, surah, the content? Sir, as you said, graves should be no higher than the ground. But is it true that the Prophet's grave is raised above the ground with a noticeable difference from the surroundings? Thank you. No, the Prophet's grave is level with the ground. The grave, in, say, remember he was buried inside of the house of Aisha. Right? If you were to go inside and look at the grave, it is level with the ground. They didn't add anything to it. When you dig the body, dig out the hole for the body, you put the body in and you put the earth back, there will be a certain amount of earth which is displaced. But as soon as the ground becomes moist from the water that is in the ground all around, then it settles and it becomes flat. That is the prophet's grave. Now, people in time, after the time of the Prophet ﷺ, generations later, they expanded the Prophet ﷺ's masjid to include his grave. It never was inside the masjid during the time of the Sahaba. No. So it's in Aisha's house, which is outside the masjid. And later they built over it, you know, this uh, cage. You see this uh, brass cage that you see around it now, the house. And on top of it, the Ottoman Turks, they built a green dome, a big dome over the grave of the Prophet Muhammad. And, yes, today that has become the symbol of Medina, the green dome. But in fact, that symbol is one which if the Prophet Muhammad was here, he would smash it. He would destroy it. Because it is against his teachings, against Islam. And it is what, as our sister is asking here, it has become a justification for people elsewhere to build structures over grace. Going against the commandment of the Prophet Muhammad himself. Yes. 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 Yes.
if the intention is to actually express, but and without intending to tend that accumulation in the way of Allah, in this Allah. To accumulate wealth. If people didn't accumulate wealth, there would be no zakat to pay. Zakat is compulsory. And the only way to pay it is to accumulate some wealth. So obviously the accumulation of wealth in and of itself is not haram. What is haram is when we become so absorbed in that accumulation that we forget the purpose of our being here. So we don't pay any zakah. We don't even think about paying zakah. Because spending in the way of Allah is first and foremost is paying zakah. Then other forms of charity that we should give. Whether it is for jihad, or whether it is for building a masjid, or you know, whatever. Different things that we can sacrifice of our wealth to do. So we should be clear that what is being spoken of here is the excess. The excess where the person loses track, loses track of the very purpose for his or her existence. Okay. So our brother's question, the sisters who may not have heard it, is regarding our efforts at work to improve our position, you know, to get a managerial post, you know, to move up the ladder. Everybody who gets in would like to move up the ladder. Now, is this something evil? No. No. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that Allah loves from each and every one of us. If we do anything, we should do it to the best of our ability. Strive as hard as we can. Do it as well as we can. And if as a result of that, we move up in our job, Alhamdulillah, no harm at all. However, the point is that we should not make that our goal. We're becoming the manager becomes the be-all and the end-all for our whole existence. In which case, we will do anything to get that post. You know? Now the ends will justify the means. Right? If we want to be manager, it means we have to tell, slander some of our, our, our co-workers, you know, so that their chances will be reduced and ours will be increased. Because the, the upper management will distrust them, you know. So this everything becomes, as I say, and you know, everything becomes uh, acceptable in love and war, right? You know, this is war here now. No, no, this is this is not the way. You know, the Islamic way is we strive, we make our utmost efforts, and then we trust in Allah. We leave the rest to Allah. If, as a result of our efforts, Allah destines that our wealth will increase, our position increases, we say, Alhamdulillah. We give thanks to Allah and we give the rights that Allah have, has defined in our wealth to those who have a right to it, who are needy. But if we don't get, you know, instant success, we don't move up the ladder, then we don't fall into a state, you know, where we're so depressed and, you know, oh, you know, what happened, you know, you start to, you know, wonder whether your co-workers, they must have slandered you and, you know, whatever, you know, you start to distrust the people around you and you're negative and, you know, why Allah, why, you know. No. If Allah didn't give it to you, you say, MashaAllah. It is as Allah willed. Because if it was good for you, Allah would give it to you. For sure. Allah is not unfair. Allah says He does not oppress anyone. But Asa and Takrahu Shay'an Wahua Khiru Lakum wa Asa and Tuhibu Shay'an Wahua Sharu Lakum. Perhaps, as Allah says, you may dislike something which is good for you. Not moving up the rung. You dislike it. But it is better for you. And perhaps you may love something which is evil for you. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. And Allah knows and you don't know. That's the bottom line. That's what we have to live with. That's what keeps us content, keeps us on an even keel in our life. So we're able to handle the good times and the bad times. The Prophet said, the life of the believer 
is an amazing thing. And it is only in the case of the true believer. Whenever good comes to him, he thanks Allah and is rewarded for it. Whenever evil befalls him, he's patient and Allah rewards him for it. So his whole life is rewarded. This is only the case of the true believer who can have that patience. Patience keeps him from haram. He doesn't become impatient, so impatient that he can't wait to get this next thing, so he ends up doing something haram. Everybody wants a house. Now if you work and you save, you see, at the rate that I'm saving, it will take me about 50 years for me to raise enough money to buy this house. And maybe inflation will make it such that when I'm 50 years come, that money will not be able to buy the house then. Yeah. Huh? So what happens? We become impatient. There is a mortgage scheme. <laughs> and we say, okay, we can get this and pay off our mortgage in 20 years, we'll have the house. You know, our impatience right, leads us into sin. Yes, Pastor. In case of a death in the family, is it correct or incorrect to carry out reading of the Qur'an collectively? That is, each reading a chapter or two. So this practice, they call Khatm al-Qur'an, right? Where the Qur'an is divided up into little sections, 30 parts, and this, you know, distributed amongst people, they all gather together on the 40th day or whatever, and everybody is reading on top of each other, right? This is useless. This is totally useless. This is not reading the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, if the Qur'an is recited, be quiet and listen to it. You're all everybody on top of each other. How is this? The very Qur'an is commanding you to be silent and listen to its recitation. And Allah says in the Qur'an also, you know, that Qur'an read the Qur'an in slow, measured tones. All of what we're doing is against what the Qur'an itself is telling us to do. How can this please Allah? There's no reward there at the end of all of that. We've just wasted our time, made our, our throats hoarse, you know. This is all we've done. We've come out of it with zero. And then we think we can give this reward to anybody. I mean, the issue of whether reward can be given to the dead or not is another issue. I'm not talking about that. Right? There are certain things Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has defined that we may do for the dead. Fast for them. Make hajj for them, and the reward can go to them if we have asked Allah to give the reward to them. Whether recitation of the Quran or other things can go or not, there's difference of opinion amongst the scholars regarding it. So I'm not talking about that aspect. I'm talking about the act. On the 40th day, we say, where did this 40th day come from? Where did this 40th day come from? Did Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu tell us anything about the 40th day? No. Did the companions do anything on the 40th day? No. So it means we have innovated. We have done something displeasing to Allah to gather on the 40th day. One. Then, reciting the Qur'an in this fashion, quickly, which the Qur'an has forbidden us. On top of each other, all in voices and hearing each other, which the Qur'an has forbidden us. Not knowing what we're even saying. So we are like, as Allah describes the Jews, you know, ignorant of their, their books, etc. Like donkeys carrying books on their backs. Himaran yahmilu asfara. This is what it will become. The Quran is like a book on the back of a donkey. The book may have great knowledge in it, but the donkey cannot benefit from it. See, this is the similitude which Allah has given us in the Quran to reflect on. To read the Quran in that fashion is to be like a donkey. This is what Allah is telling us. You read the Quran, you should understand what you're reading. Read it in Arabic, read it in your language. So you know what you're reading and reflect on the meaning. Is it correct to hold a gathering in the house in order to read the Quran without any specific reason, i.e. death in the family or entry into a new house? Yes, it's permissible. Together, the, together somebody reads the Quran 
others listen and the meanings are discussed, you know, so there is benefit out of it. Now to sit and listen to the Quran's recitation simply because it is musical is another danger. You know, you get somebody who can recite very beautifully, we have contests in recitation, you know, you hear some of the reciters when they recite, you know, certain individuals, well-known individuals, they recite, they finish the verse, you know, you hear people in the back of, Allah, 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 Subhanallah, Allah, 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 People carrying on, yeah, 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 yeah. Egypt and other places, carrying on in the background. Sounds, you know, this is the same kind of thing like pop star, you know, Michael Jackson, he's stopped the line, everybody's screaming, yeah, screaming, you know, same kind of thing. So the recitation of the Quran becomes like a pop singer, you know. So much so that some of these guys have even gone to Paris and recited on stage in Paris with the Parisians, they're clapping to, you know. Beautiful. This is delusion. Of course, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, the one who doesn't beautify the Qur'an with his voice is not of us. So we're not supposed to read the Qur'an, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. No, no, no. No, we're supposed to read it in nice, you know, beautiful, as much as we can. Of course, some voices can only go so far. But we should make it in nice tones. Okay? We are commanded. But, always, things in excess. The extremes. You want people go into the extremes, then what can be halal and good turns over to become haram and evil. That's why we are known as Ummatan Wasafa, the middle nation. We are told to follow that middle path. Which English translation of Sahih al Bukhari hadith is exact and where can we obtain it? There really is only one translation available now, complete. And that is the one done by Muhsin Khan. It's available at most of the bookstores. There's a new one, I guess, also done uh, out of Lebanon. But this one here is terrible. By Darul al Fikr, yes, Darul al Fikr. They're just turning out books just for money. You know, these hardback books and terrible translations. So I would not advise anybody to buy the Darul al Fikr books coming out of Lebanon. But the one uh, known as uh, Sahih al Bukhari by Muhsin Khan, this is the one which is. It's really good. Yeah, it is um, a one-volume condensed uh, version. It is available in some of the bookstores, like Darul Qalam in Dubai. It is available. Inshallah. No? Further questions? Question. You know, we're talking about these green zones, and you know, what's the attitude of the authority in the scholars? Well, I gave, I, I gave you the attitude of the scholars. No, that's right, but general opinion. No, that is the opinion of the scholars yeah. who know. I mean, of course, they are ignorant scholars. Yeah. You know? general the general scholars who know, who have solid knowledge, who speak from the Quran and the Sunnah, use the evidence from the Quran and Sunnah to support what they're saying, they know. It's been spoken about, the, about you know, for a long time. But for various political reasons, uh, the authorities have not dealt with it. Inshallah, time will come, if not before the Mahdi, in the time of the Mahdi, it will be rectified. Mm-hmm. About this question, when we miss the first rakah of a three or four unit prayer, we will end up reciting tashahud three times. In the case of a three-unit prayer, we'll end up reciting one, praying one rakah, making tashahud. Praying another rakah, making tashahud. Praying a third rakah, and making tashahud. I mean, is this allowed? Yes. It is allowed. This is the format that develops with us having to bring a missed unit of prayer and making this tashahud. There's no uh, set uh, form, like the, the norm is two. But if three become required, then we do three. Yeah. 
the one which is missed, which you normally would recite Surah Al-Fatiha in, when you are bringing it at the end of the prayer, you also recite Surah Al-Fatiha and the Surah following it. And there's a special sitting in the last The last sitting? Foot position, do you mean? Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu favored what is known as At-Tawarruq That is he would sit on his left thigh and prop up his right foot put the shin of his left foot under the shin of the right foot No, shin of the left foot huh? under the shin of the right foot Okay. The foot coming out underneath the shin of the right foot. Left foot coming out on it. No. Yeah, I mean, if you are not used to doing it, right? Uh, you, you might find yourself, some people end up like this, you know, you're leaning and you got your head up there. No. But in this case, you know, it's not necessary. Because it's, not a, it's not a required position, right? Huh? So it's enough for you to sit in the iftirash, the, 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 the regular one where you sit on the bottom of your left foot and top of your right foot, right? You know, or even sitting on the bottom of both of your feet, it's permissible. You know, whatever, huh? whatever, whatever is convenient for your body. You know, because the prayer, you know, it's not asking you to put yourself in painful, difficult positions, you know? I mean, you do what you can of what the Prophet ﷺ did and he taught, you know? Yes, yeah, to others, sure, sure, sure. And even for yourself, I mean, how are you feeling like this? You're on the verge of falling over each time, you know. Some people have seen the sunnah prayer, they Shifting positions for the sunnah prayer. Actually, there's a hadith in Abu Dawood, Sunnah of Abu Dawood, and which refers where Prophet ﷺ had recommended shifting positions, but from what I recall, this hadith is not authentic. Right? not authentic. If you want to shift, you can. I mean, uh, some people have suggested that, you know, the, the merit of shifting is that you, every place you make sujood will bear witness for you on the Day of Judgment. But this is a weak argument. Because if you make sujood on the same place twice, then it will make witness for you twice. It will be equal to just doing it in other places. It's not, you know, this is, of course, a person who doesn't think about it sounds, yes, that's right. The more places you can make to Jews in, you know, <laughs> but if you think about it uh, logically, it's not, it's not really a good argument. Uh, try that during the prayer, during long surah, just to keep the mind wandering. Most of the time, okay, my mind wanders on the long surah. Can you keep your eyes closed just to concentrate on the surah? In the concert? My brother's question, uh, to keep one's eyes closed during long recitations by the Imam, yeah. by the Imam, right? The imam, yeah. In order to increase concentration. Well, generally speaking, closing of the eyes puts you into another world, brother. I don't know if it's going to really increase your concentration, you know, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, you know, what you, yeah, so what you have to do is to find the middle point there, right, you try to focus on a particular point on the rug, you know, where you're going to make your sujood, and try to keep your eyes and your mind focused on there, on Allah, and one of the things that will help you again is to learn Arabic, you see, if you learned Arabic, then the long recitation of the Imam is not going to, you know, you're not going to be finding it boring and, you know, your mind is starting to wander because you have more of an opportunity to reflect. You're hearing what Allah is saying. It's just like somebody talking to you. You know, you know, Allah is communicating with you. You listen. So part of the problem, that's where the root of the problem is actually. The fact that you didn't learn the language of the final revelation. And this is the duty of each and every Muslim to learn Arabic. To hear the words of Allah as they were revealed. Because the Quran is an Arabic Quran. As Allah said, He revealed Quran and Arabiyya. An Arabic Quran. The miracle of the Quran is in the Arabic. Not in the English or the Tamil or the Sinhalese <coughs> translation. No. It is in the Arabic. Hmm? At the end of the prayer, if the Imam asks Dua, asking Dua, is it an innovation that people come behind the operation? Five times 
raising the hands in dua after prayer or during prayer. This is something which the Prophet did on certain occasions. The prayer for rain, Eid prayer, Zuma, uh, the um, also the prayer of um, what's that one that the Shafi people tend to do in every Fajr? The Kunut, yes, in Kunut, you know. But to do it regularly after the compulsory prayers, he didn't do. If you did it spontaneously one day, there would be no harm. If you just did it from yourself, one day, no harm. But to make it into a regular ritual, where people think that this now is a part of the prayer, your prayer is incomplete, if dua is not made with your hands raised, etc., etc., then this becomes an innovation in the religion. Because it wasn't done by Prophet Muhammad Well, you know, it wasn't Maya. Some Bhattari had three ayahs in the Bible by a play. It was all in a play, so I could put So this question, is there a minimum number of verses of the Qur'an that may be recited in prayer three for example that you cannot recite less than three verses why? because the shortest chapter of the Qur'an is three verses no there is no minimum that shortest chapter of the Qur'an is shorter than Ayatul Kursi Ayatul Kursi is much longer and the Prophet Muhammad himself did not specify any length. So you recite of the Qur'an, whatever you have memorized, whatever you understand, etc., whatever you can. There are no minimum, no maximum numbers. And in all four surahs, and in all four units, should be recited a Fatiha and another surah, or last two only Fatiha? Most commonly, Prophet ﷺ recited another surah or surahs after the first two units. However, it is reported that he did recite on the third and the fourth on occasion. It is reported. So it means that it is permissible. If the Imam recites Kunut every single day in the Fajr prayer, I would not advise, you know, the following of it. This is not uh, from the Sunnah. But in our mosque, Imam uh, needs some time, you know, he just wants us for some time. If those so want to do it. Uh, yeah. mm. okay. mm. But, uh, you know, this is a compromise that he's making. Um, it's a compromise to allow people to do things which the Prophet Sallallahu didn't do. You know, so, uh, it's questionable. It's questionable whether it really is a wise move. I would prefer to try to educate the people to what it is, you know, what should be done, rather than just to not do it but leaving a space for those who want to do it. Is it wrong to ask dua after every prayer? No, no. To make dua after every prayer is perfectly permissible. It's good. But it's the raising of the hands in dua. This is the point. And not, and not only that raising, but in congregation altogether. This is what is not permissible. Okay. To so philosophy now. I heard the Imam, I heard from our chat. As far as I have learned, there is one prophet who was raised up, still living in the heavens, and that is Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Finish. As the Prophet still living, 
like Khidr, etc. This is conjecture, mythology. So he has mentioned two prophets. One is uh, Idris alayhi salam and uh, Isa alayhi salam Adok and then uh, Iyas alayhi salam and uh, Khidr alayhi salam mm. and the other. And I said, people came and asked me, I did not directly Well, you know, so may any statement like that, how can we know? We can only know if Prophet Muhammad told us so. And I have not come across any authentic hadith to that effect. Israeliyat, you know, meaning uh, stories attributed to the Jewish uh, scholars and scribes, yes, there are plenty of them. You know, you can read till this day. You can read about Melchizedek in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They call him the King of Salem without beginning of days and ending of days. He's an, an eternal being walking the earth. You know, they got all kinds of, you know, mythological beings that they have put into their, you know, and they have about Idris being taken up in the chariot. They don't call him Idris, though. It's called Ezekiel. Right? This is Ezekiel, supposedly, went up into the heavens in a chariot and, well, you know, we can't say, Prophet said, Isa, alayhi salam, that people thought they crucified him, but they didn't. Allah raised him up. That's it. Where revelation ends, that we are certain about, we stop. We don't go beyond that when we're speaking of things which we have no knowledge. You know, don't speak about what you have no knowledge of. I'd like to just uh, thank everybody for patiently listening to the presentation and I hope that what has been said you know, has been of some benefit to you all that you will take it to heart you know, this surah is a very ser- serious 